Okay, so now let's look at the Voyage of the Beagle, the work itself. This is uh, one of Darwin's first works, and it really says nothing about evolution until the later editions. In the early editions, it, it said nothing at all. It just described the trip that he went on. But in later editions, he's going to hide an essay. Uh, he's going to interleave an essay about evolution into the whole account. Uh, it's almost like something, his theory is hiding in plain sight there. Um, and so uh, there's various uh, interpretations for why he did that. Uh, you see, for the 20 years uh, between the publication of The Voyage of the Beagle and the publication of The Origin of the Species, uh, the book that changed the world, uh, he really wanted to publish The Origin, but he was holding back. Uh, he was quite reluctant to publish it for various motivations and reasons that run all the way from, well, he wanted to be very careful, uh, to social considerations uh, about, you know, the kind of impact that his idea would have upon the world. But anyway, in later editions, <clears throat> like I said, there is a, you, and if you happen to get one of the later editions, you will see in there ideas about evolution, but they're subtle. Now, the voyage intrigues and fascinates most readers. Uh, it, it draws you in. Darwin is a very good writer. Uh, and that's one of the reasons for the <clears throat> immediate popularity and the su success of his views. Even though he's an academic and he's a scientist and so forth and so on, he's got a high literary style that draws you in and engages you. And so he fascinates readers with all kinds of vivid descriptions. And the book reads kind of like a travelogue. I mean, you can imagine <clears throat> in the 1830s, someone traveling all the way around the world and seeing all kinds of indigenous peoples and new plants and new species and weird practices and weather phenomena and so forth and so on. <clears throat> and he's pretty much explaining all that. So Darwin is a pretty good writer. The pace of the text, the endless observations about flora and fauna, about the indigenous peoples, their customs, uh, will keep people riveted. Uh, it's kind of a page turner book. Uh, it was very popular after publication, and it helped push Darwin into the public limelight. And very quickly, Dar Darwin is going to be seen as a leading naturalist. Now, remember, this all happens before the age of travel, before the age of photography. Uh, yes, there are newspapers and so forth and so on, and there might be a, a, a piece of art in there of some strange animal or something like that, but for the most part, uh, people don't have exposure to what's going on around the world, and so they're very interested in, in these kind of things. Uh, and because they know that these discoveries have been made, they know that there are distant lands around the world, and so there's an intense interest to learn about these uh, foreign, uh, these uh, overseas places. So people voraciously desire to experience these distant lands, and so his book just kind of fed right into that. Now, it reads like an an ethnography and a travelogue and a kind of a discovery guide as well to new plants, animals, and lands. Later on, uh, the edition will be published with all kinds of illustrations uh, because there were some uh, expert artists on board the, the Beagle as well to draw these things. And so uh, these later editions that were illustrated were very popular. I must say, that had I been a young man, I would have been the first to sign up for such an expedition and it would have been uh, right up my alley uh, because I was so adventurous. Now, in our sample reading today, we encounter one of the most famous passages in The Voyage of the Beagle, and this is the description of the f now famous Darwin's finches. And the famous illustration of the beaks of the finches is supposed to show the variation within the species and how each one of these finches that were kind of isolated on different parts of the Galapagos Islands uh, evolved differently in different directions, such that their beaks have different shapes. And so this is supposed to show natural selection. Later on uh, in the origin of the species, he will use that is to show that. Uh, so the various beak shapes developed independently from a common ancestor. And so the, the section on the Galapagos Islands, especially the stories about the giant tortoises, uh, are quite uh, enrapturing and intriguing. Uh, so 
that's one of the most famous sections. Darwin will later conclude, for example, that all these adaptations that he saw, for example, with the beaks, allowed some finches to survive and to reproduce better, thus natural selection that we will discuss later. Now, two decades later, Darwin will publish his epic Origin of the Species that draws on such findings uh, as these, uh, these finches. But the voyage of the beagle, at, when it first comes out, really contains nothing about evolution per se, even though while he was on the voyage, he had already kind of bought into the idea. And, and like I said, that was nothing new. Um, and we're going to see even, even Darwin's grandfather held to a theory of evolution. But we're going to see why, what makes Darwin so special amongst all this uh, constellation of thinkers who believed in evolution. And we're going to see that uh, his contribution is going to be like the last puzzle piece. So, uh, The Voyage of the Beagle, an endearing and imaginative description um, during the age of discovery when people had a voracious appetite for these kind of things and people read an awful lot, uh, far more than people do today. So if you get a chance to read chapters 27 and 28, uh, 27 is on the Galapagos Archipelago and chapter 28 is on Tahiti. These are probably the most memorable selections of the entire work. So now let's turn to The Origin of the Species itself, published in 1859. So over 20 years after his return from the voyage of the Beagle, The Origin of the Species will become perhaps the most important scientific publication in history. The only thing that perhaps could rival it during this age would have been one that we've already seen earlier, uh, the Principia Mathematica of Newton. But it is certainly one of the most controversial books to ever be published, even to this very moment. So our selection from the introduction to this work explains the purpose and the scope of this book. Uh, Darwin knows what he's up against. He knows that there's a missing piece to this somewhat popular idea of evolution at this time. And so he fully understands the scientific challenge facing him. He was not the first to suggest evolution. Indeed, variation of the idea go all the way back to Aristotle 2,100 years earlier. <clears throat> and so he started the discipline of biology 2,100 years before Darwin. And immediately preceding Darwin, there were two thinkers who were, um, again, somewhat important. We, we saw that they were minor figures uh, in the introduction. Uh, Lamarck and Spencer both claimed uh, some variation of the idea of evolution. Lamarck, for example, claimed that um, uh, when a member of a species changed through adapting to its environment, that uh, those changes of that one member would be passed on to uh, its offspring. And we now know that this is incorrect. Uh, what, what Lamarck was saying, just imagine, see if I can give you an example. Let's just suppose that, uh, you know, I decide to start going down to the gym every day and you know start working out and take a lot of protein and so forth and I you know get all muscled up like you know Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that well the idea Lamarck had was that characteristic of me muscling up and, and everything would be passed on to my offspring okay we now know that that's not the case okay but he held that that was the way that species uh, changed and adapted uh, that mechanism is incorrect, and, and Darwin is going to find the correct mechanism, okay? So, uh, Spencer also held to some ideas. In fact, he's the one that gives Darwin the phrase, well, he doesn't give it to him, Darwin borrows the phrase, survival of the fittest. Um, but Spencer's ideas are also have a lot of wrong uh, ideas that were pr disproven and Darwin is going to try to distance himself uh, from Spencer's ideas. But both of these guys preceded Darwin. So like I said, even Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, held the view of evolution, and he did make some precious insights into the adaptation of species and the common ancestry of all animals from one species. So the notion of natural selection was kind of in the air at this time, uh, two, even two decades before Darwin sets foot on uh, the Beagle and before Darwin reads a very important work for this whole story, 
uh, written by Thomas Malthus uh, on population, which we'll discuss in just a moment. But what Darwin, and then later, but before Darwin publishes his ideas in The Origin of the Species, uh, a guy named Wallace, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace, uh, what they both grasped was necessary, uh, and Darwin succeeded in explaining, was demonstrating the proper causal mechanism for evolution, which we now call natural selection. And yes, the phrase survival the fittest is deemed to be a kind of parallel phrase, but some people think that Darwin should not have used that, okay? He should not have borrowed that concept from Spencer. But uh, yeah, we're gonna discuss natural selection here in just a minute. But it's Darwin's vast data set that made him the ideal person <clears throat> to set forth these ideas in The Origin of the Species. He had far more data and far more explanation than Wallace. Wallace just had the right idea, exactly the same idea. But Wallace's idea was not, um, he didn't have it backed up with a lot of findings the way Darwin did, <clears throat> okay? So Darwin's initial flash of insight into natural selection came when he was reading a work by an economist named Thomas Malthus uh, called The Essay on the Principle of Population. Malthus was an English economist, and uh, his ideas, somewhat controversial today, but uh, Malthusian ideas on population growth and food production are something that intrigued Darwin and kind of gave him this flash of insight. It had an aha moment. Now, Malthus is no biologist. He's talking about economics and population growth. But the principle that he laid out there was one that Darwin borrowed and immediately saw that applied to uh, the questions that he and so many other people were asking, what is the mechanism of, of evolution? So what Malthus claimed was this, is that populations always outgrow the food production, creating a surplus population of poor people who are malnourished and who will die because the malnourished, they're gonna be sick and they're going to die or just die from starvation. But the increase in the population will grow too fast and these impoverished people die off and thus now the population numbers come back down and the population number remains stable. So the question is this, why is it that we see so many species, including human beings, produce far more offspring then are going to survive. The population numbers remain relatively stable. And Darwin had noticed this as well. He, he would take, uh, you know, notice how, how a, a popu the numbers of a certain species remain relatively stable. They increase very slowly, or if not, or not at all. But they produce far more offspring, okay? And so this is a, was a big question. Now, Darwin will adapt this Malthusian doctrine to the vast species that compete for food and overproduce, only to have the excess population of that species die off or be eaten by other species. <clears throat> the individuals uh, in each species who are the strongest get enough food, while the weaker members die of starvation. The stronger are going to reproduce and to pass on their traits to the next generation. And this leads ineluctably to a new species, says Darwin. And that's you know, one of the things that is going to be um, the, the final piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> now, as a kind of a cultural tie-in, uh, you may remember the, the famous uh, story uh, of Dickens about the character Scrooge in The Christmas Carol, written in 1843, right about this same time. Dickens has uh, the Malthusian philosophy and doctrine uh, uttered by Scrooge. In other words, Scrooge is kind of a Malthusian character in this story. So Scrooge inf infamously scowls uh, when asked to donate money to the poor, and he was told, well, aren't there poor houses? And then he was told, well, the poor would rather die than to have to go into the poor houses. And he says, well, if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. So this is the Malthusian idea that the poor who are malnourished and can't feed themselves and so forth and so on need to die off because after all, 
that's the only way that the strong are going to go on to survive. And so the ghosts of Christmas will go on to haunt Scrooge with these words uh, since Tiny Tim Cratchit is one of the surplus population that should die according to uh, his philosophy that he's uh, borrowed from Malthus. So Scrooge is a hated Malthusian character and for that reason many of us open our hearts and wallets during Christmas time. Um, so, but Darwin is no Scrooge himself, but he does read Malthus in 1838 and gets this flash of intuition that will hit him. And this is the way he states it. I happen to read, for amusement, Malthus on population and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habits of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones would be destroyed. The result would be the formation of a new species. So you can see here, he's, he's being quite honest and, and, and uh, open about that he's taking a Malthusian observation and applying it to this biological question. <clears throat> so natural selection was conceived at this moment. Now Alfred Wallace will read Malthus some 20 years later and he will intuit the exact same thing from reading Malthus. Now during that 20 years Darwin is kind of sitting on all this. He's, he's developing it and he's writing on it and so forth and so on. But he's, and he might discuss it with Lyle and a couple of other guys, but he's not going public with this information at all. So in 1858, and this is just a year before Darwin publishes Origin of the Species, Wallace has this flash of insight too. And he writes a paper explaining the exact same ideas that Darwin had worked out for 20 years. Now Lyle had already warned Darwin, look, somebody's going to come along and see the same thing that you've seen and they're going to publish it and they're going to get all the credit for it. They're going to scoop you on this, okay? And so Darwin is kind of like, ah, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. He doesn't really pay attention to Lyle on this. But anyway, uh, Wallace and Darwin were friends. Now at this time, Wallace is on the other side of the world doing research. Uh, but uh, anyway, Wallace sends this paper to Darwin just by happenstance and says, hey, will you take a look at this idea and tell me, you know, what you think? Am I crazy here? And so sending the paper to Darwin for advice before public publication, Darwin was shocked that his discovery, the exact same discovery, was now in peril of being attributed to another scientist. Uh, and this is what is going to compel him to get busy and write The Origin of the Species. Now, at this time, Darwin was trying to kind of amass an encyclopedic work, a huge work that will never be published, okay? But he's going to try to overwhelm any objection with encyclopedic evidence. And he realizes that this big book on evolution will never get finished. And so the origin of the species was meant to be a short compendium, kind of a shortened version of that, okay? And it's Wallace's letter to him with Wallace's paper that's going to compel him to go ahead and publish it. Now, Darwin's a fair man on this. He didn't want not want to suppress Wallace's insight, obviously, or anything like that. So Darwin, uh, Darwin's friends suggested that the, the two things be published simultaneously side by side in a way that everyone could see that the ideas are the same, but Darwin had worked these ideas out for two decades. And so even later on, Wallace will admit that, that Darwin is really the father of this whole idea of natural selection and evolution, okay? The, but they both acknowledge that they got these ideas independently by reading the same work, and that was Malthus's work on population. But the real credit belongs to Darwin. So whether Malthus's economic theories about population growth were correct or not, and they're probably not correct, uh, I haven't launched into a deep study of that, but I do know that there's quite a bit of opposition to Malthusian ideas that he was incorrect about population growth and so forth. There are many, many other things that affect population growth that Malthus did not take into consideration. However, he did inspire Darwin's ideas of natural selection with descent from a common ancestor. So 
The main argument of the origin is this, and it's in our reading for this week. Darwin states it very clearly. Like I said, he's a good writer. He tells the reader exactly what you need to know in very plain, clear language. Uh, but in our reading uh, this week, we read the, the, uh, the introduction uh, to origin. And he says there, as many more individuals of each species are born that can possibly survive, and as consequently, there is a frequently recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary, however slightly, in any matter profitable to itself under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving and thus be naturally selected. From the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new form, its new and modified form. So the idea here is that, yes, it is a survival of the fittest, but it's almost like it's a reproduction of the most aptly adapted. So whatever variation in an, an offspring, a brood of some type of a species of an animal and so forth, whichever one of those is most aptly adapted to its environment, will get more food, will avoid being eaten, will go on to flourish and then to propagate, in other words, to reproduce. So the way I am often explain this, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to see. Let's just imagine some dragonflies. So a dragonfly lays you know, a bunch of eggs. And so all of these little dragonflies hatch, and so they're going to have some slight variations. Now, Darwin didn't know about genetics at the time, but we do now know about genetics. And so the slight genetic variations maybe makes one of those dragonflies have wings that are just a little bit longer, maybe like a half of a millimeter longer than the other ones. So that dragonfly is going to be a little faster. He's going to get away from predators. He's going to be able to get to food and eat it before the other ones and so forth and so on. So let's just say 10,000 dragonflies were born. <clears throat> Well, this one goes on to survive. The rest get eaten or die off from starvation or something like that. And so now this dragonfly is going to go on and reproduce because it's going to live. And so thus, it will pass on its genetic characteristics to the next generation. And the same thing will happen over and over and over and over again. Darwin theorized that eventually these tiny small variations would stack up into a slow morphing, a uniformitarian view of one species morphing into another species. Okay? That's the gist of the argument. And, but what makes him so powerful is that he identifies the causal mechanism, which none of the other guys had done. Neither his grandfather, Lamarck, Spencer, uh, Lyle, None of, none of his predecessors had done that for the past 2,100 years, going back to Aristotle. So, Darwin will later apply the phrase survival of the fittest uh, in a later edition of the origin. So the origin has various editions, and as it goes through various editions, there's a few changes. And one is that he adds Spencer's term, uh, survival of the fittest. And uh, Darwin was trying to correct Spencer's views in fact, he's trying to distance himself and show that he has no connection to Spencer, really. Um, but he does borrow this term, and it was maybe not fortuitous that he did, because it's the term that stuck, right? Okay, It just has a ring to it. Survival of the fittest, we hear it all the time. So uh, certainly, uh, he's trying to distance himself, but the phrase's rhetorical appeal was irresistible, and it did seem to capture the main idea of natural selection. I think a more accurate but less catchy phrase would be the reproduction of the aptly adapted. The idea is that only those species members that are ap aptly adapted for a particular environment will get the chance to reproduce. So survival of the fittest stuck, becoming a part of our cultural vocabulary now for a naturalistic process of competing and evolving life forms.